Hi, this is Terry Dennery of the MathWorks. All right, in this video, we're going to start using that model. And I think it's in this video that we're really going to start offering some new methods and new technology that I think are going to be very valuable in the way that mechatronic systems are developed. All right, and so our topic is inverse mechanics. All right, and what we mean by that, and you know, maybe a little bit more familiar terminology are the terms inverse kinematics, inverse dynamics. So we're going to be doing both of them. Right, and the basic idea is that you know that we can make our mechanics, at least through our model and our simulation, make our mechanics move the way we need it to move, but then really find out what it takes to to, to make it do that. All right, and so with the, the the topic of inverse kinematics, well, what that really is, you know, is let's move that end effector to where it needs to be, and then let's figure out what the angles are can be required of our actuators to achieve that motion. All right? Now, and that's very important for our trajectory planning and it will automate and make things much, much easier to, to kind of define those paths and, and, and those trajectories for our motors. Okay, now inverse dynamics is about making it move the way you want it to move and then finding out what's required from a torque and power perspective of your actuators to achieve that motion. Right? And that's very important when it comes to selecting the appropriate actuators, but also in defining the controls. And it will introduce the concept of feed forward controls. All right. And um, anyways, I think these are very important topics. And um, let's get started. OK, so let's take a look at our ro robot model uh, we've seen in various of uh, various videos before. Uh, it's a full model of the mechanics, the electronics, and the controls. Right? And so we discussed how there's really two robots showing up here. One in blue is a precise and accurate representation of the trajectory plan. The one that's multicolored, the robot that's multicolored, that's our plant model. That's one where we're basically modeling directly the mechanics and the electronics and we're applying control theory to essentially make it move and essentially follow the blue robot. And the mere fact that they do seem to be moving simultaneously um, indicates that the controls are working quite well. So let's go uh, back to the Simulink model, and I'm going to reveal a, a, a little bit more of, a, of what's going on here. You know, basically it's in this block that we got the mechanics and the electronics of the robot. Uh, it's in this block that we have the blue robot, okay? And then it, that blue robot is used to essentially calculate ideal torques, uh, applying essentially a feed-forward control strategy. Uh, the other thing is that there's a third robot. The third robot is used to calculate the motor traje trajectories. Okay, so let's show it. Let's hit run. Okay, so we'll see our, I'll call it my plant model robot, uh, initially is in a vertical position. Now, vertical position is not a great position for this robot, and it's singular for a number of reasons. And so what we're seeing here is the yellow robot takes on what I'd call our, a very useful initial pose for the robot. Okay, and it's the yellow b robot that's really doing, I'll call it the difficult calculation of figuring out all these different motor, you know, angles that really give it the trajectory that we're going to want it to take, all right? And so at the end, we just kind of move it back out of its initial pose into a vertical position. All right, so let's take a look and see how we did this. So I'm going to uh, copy this motion trajectory block, and let's just open up a new model file. And we'll just paste that in. All right. Okay. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of dive into it. All right. And um, basically, we're going to see here's our, our robot arm. Oops, went a little bit too far. But, you know, I've probably shown this in previous videos, and hopefully you kind of recognize the, in, the, the image of the full robot is expressed through uh, Simscape multibody. All right. And uh, it's really this connection right here. All right. And I am going to dive into this one a little bit. And I want to just kind of introduce this. This is that gray plate. You, you may have noticed it, maybe you haven't. But the whole key to this is really programming this to move the way we want it to move. 
right? And uh, I might get a little bit more deep into how we did this, but essentially there's such a thing in SimScape multibody called a, a, a bushing joint, which allows program motion for all six prismatic or our translational, I'm sorry, all three of our prismatic translational axes, X, Y, and Z, as well as all three of our rotational axes, right? And so it's in blocks like these that we're, we really kind of program that motion. All right, and so coming back here, and you saw that I disconnected that, so let's you know keep it disconnected, right? And now let's hit run. So you'll see by removing that connection between the robot and the gray plate, as we did in the Simulink model, uh, that the the robot, the yellow robot's going to just flop around. You know, and that's simply gravity acting on it, and that's just kind of the movement that you would see. Now the programming of the gray plate actually is quite easy. You know, each of those axes kind of move very independent of each other, and it's it's really not a super difficult thing to program its movement. Okay, so let's uh, reintroduce that connection between the gray plate and the end effector. You probably can't see it, or you might barely be able to see it, but that says end effector right there. So that's the part of the robot we're connecting to. Uh, one more thing I want to do is let's introduce a scope. And I want to measure one of these signals, all right? And I do want to point out that with regard to our motors, we're making various measurements. Uh, among those will be motion, torque, speed, and power. In this case, we're making a choice to measure motion. So I'll show you what that is when we uh, get the numbers calculated. So by reconnecting right here the end effector of this robot to the gray plate, now the rest of the robot needs to follow that gray plate. All right? And so each of these actuators, these motors, are going to need to take on angles that will accommodate the motion of that gray plate. And so our inverse kinematics is really simply observing what those angles will be via the simulation. All right? And so the measurement that we put on it was right here for what we call the turntable axis, right? And if we zoom in right here, we'll see there's the turntable. Here's our measurement, right? And what we're looking at really is um, that it goes from a value of zero to 90 degrees, and then from back from 90 degrees down to zero. That's the yellow curve, right? And we're going to use this information to drive a robotic simulation through the actuators. Essentially, we're going to tell the actuators how to move, and this is how we do it. And telling it simply angle versus time really isn't quite enough. We need to tell it actually the first derivative and the second derivative as well. And so the blue is our first derivative, the orange is our second derivative on this angle motion. All right. And so, anyways, you'll notice in some of my simulations that I've, I have inputs on the robot that are labeled P, V, and A. That stands for position, velocity, and acceleration. And it's by providing these signals into those robots that we can drive the motion and we can measure the torques required and the power required of these actuators. Okay, and, you know, one last thing on here. I want to bring your attention to this part of the model. Um, that we're going to be working with a vertically oriented robot that's not in that initial pose where it's hunched over. And so uh, for the two axes, forearm and wrist, we have an initial kind of rotation that we simply add on to the inverse kinematics that we got from the yellow robot that will essentially bring that vertical robot down to the hunched over position too. So now I'd like to take a robot that's directly fresh from CAD and let's hit run. Yeah, and we see, you know, fresh from CAD, it's what I call a forward dynamics robot, meaning it's receptive to torques. Um, well, I'll explain what that means in a second, too. And therefore, it simply falls due to gravity, All right? So, anyways, here's our model. Now, one of the things we do with our export from CAD is we provide two types of configurations. One's force torque being inputs. The other one would be motion. So, essentially, let's, let's kind of zoom in on this and kind of make sure it's clear, there's your P, V, and A, all right? So this is now receptive to motion, uh, to per, I'll call motion prescription, all right? Okay, and so let's just copy this. Control C, let's come back here. Uh, this is our full model. Let's bring it up a level right here. And let's just kind of take all those signals instead of sending them into a bus, let's just directly send them into this robot. And so we paste it in. And uh, control, feed them right into it like that. 
and now let's uh, hit run and see what we get. All right, and so now we see it just kind of going through the motion as described by what I call my inverse kinematics module, right? Okay, and so going back to our simulink model, we can put some measurements in, all right? And ultimately we'll do this for each of the actuators, but. Okay, and so that signal, which it's containing an awful lot of information. Uh, let's remove that, and now let's bring torque, uh, speed, uh, let's just take torque and power. Okay, and we'll send that into the scope, and you know, hit run, and let's watch the scope. Okay, and this is, you know, basically the torque carried by that turntable motor. It's very interesting, actually, that it carries torque even when it's not moving. Okay, and that's because of the rest of the robot is moving. Okay, and uh, anyways, this is awesome. This provides us very useful information to select the appropriate motors, as well as to define very effective controls, right? And um, we'll see a little bit more of the design of the controls in the next video, where we will use this inverse dynamics, you know, a model that's capable of calculating the ideal torques required of our actuators. We'll use that to define, uh, you know, a very effective controller. All right, what well, I think is really in interesting about what we did with this is I think we're beginning to see the pieces come together, all right, that we chose electric motors based on the mechanics, okay, and that we are now showing a path to defining really effective controls that's actually originating from the mechanics as well as being informed by the electronics, okay, and that, that that's the point all along with this whole series is that mechatronics really requires the collaboration of all these teams. So we've posted all the files we've been using in these videos on the MathWorks MATLAB Central File Exchange. And that means that the, the files that we're using are available to you for free download. Uh, there are various ways you can get your hands on the software tools, and I encourage you to do so and really kind of take a look at what we're doing here and see how it might work for you. So thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, if you liked it, uh, give us a thumbs up. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Um, again, we encourage you to contact us. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you. This is Terry.